Hello everyone, um, good morning, good day or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Luke, I am a Projects Officer at the Plan Viva Foundation and I will be your host for this webinar, which concerns the public consultation stage of the Farm Trace approved approach. Now, there's been a lot of interest in this webinar today, which is really good because I think it shows that there is a lot of enthusiasm within the sector to try and reduce the market access barriers for smallholder and community uh, land use projects. So that's really good. Just a bit of housekeeping before we go any further. Um, everyone is on mute, but you're very welcome to submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there will be a Q&A section at the end of the webinar and you can vote on which questions you would most like um, us to answer within the Q&A box. The webinar is also being recorded uh, and will be uploaded on the Farm Trace page on the Plan Viva website after the event so you'll be able to share it with your colleagues then. So just a bit of a breakdown of the structure of today's webinar. Um, first, considering we know that some of you um, are new to Plan Vivo, we have an introduction to what Plan Vivo is provided by our COO, Keith Bohannon. Then we'll have an explanation of how Plan Vivo ties in with Farm Trace provided by myself, uh, along with a description of the review process and where it is up to in the public consultation. After that, uh, Dr. Khalil Baker who will provide um, a presentation on farm trace, including what it is and how you use it. Um, now, Khalil is the executive director at Taking Root and Farm Trace, um, Taking Root being the uh, parent organization of Farm Trace. And he has been working on the Farm Trace tool now for over five years. Following this, um, we will have a live farm trace demonstration provided by Will Sheldon, who is the commercial director at Taking Root and Farm Trace. And then we will round off the webinar with a Q&A section. So um, again, if you would like to submit questions for that section, you can do so using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I will now hand over to Keith, who will explain a little bit more about Plan Vivo for those who are unfamiliar with the organization. Over to you, Keith. Thanks, Luke, um, and a very warm welcome to everyone again. Uh, greetings from Scotland. Um, on behalf of Plan Vivo, we're really delighted to co-host this webinar with our longtime partners, Taking Root, and we're delighted to see such a great turnout. Um, so, as Luke mentioned, just a brief background for those of you who don't already know Plan Vivo. We're a charitable foundation. We're based in Edinburgh. Uh, and we run and administer the, um, the Plan Vivo standard, which is a voluntary carbon standard. And we've been working for over 25 years with um, smallholders and communities across the world on sustainable land use projects. Our model really puts smallholders and communities at the center of the project design process, because we really believe that for to have the best impact on climate change, we need to work directly with those people most affected. And um, we also, a key component of our model is that through accessing the voluntary carbon market, the, the, the finance that comes from that should be shared equally, equitably with the smallholders and the communities. So we, we as part of the model, we um, insist that at least 60% of that finance goes back um, back to the communities on the ground. So next slide, please, Luke. In terms of our impact, so to date, um, we've issued over 4 million Plan Vivo certificates. Each certificate is equivalent of one ton CO2 emissions reduced. So we're, we're on track to deliver over 4 million uh, tons of CO2 uh, emissions reduced. Through that process, we're reaching over 20,000 smallholder farmers and engaging over 62,000 community members. So it really is, and these are spread across the world from Africa, uh, Asia, Pacific, uh, and uh, Latin America. 
through the projects then, um, that's put $25 million into these projects in developing countries. And as I mentioned earlier, 60% of that, which is $15 million, is going directly to participants. Um, but we're not just about numbers. We've also, uh, our projects have had international recognition. Uh, three of our projects have won the UN Equator Prize, uh, which is Yeda Valley in Tanzania, uh, Makoka Pomoja in Kenya, uh, and also Laurel Valley in Vanuatu. Uh, and also uh, the Trees for Global Benefits Project in Uganda has, has won the UN Seed Award. So that's more about the impact and the quality of the work that's been done by our project partners on the ground. And that's really the essence of what we're trying to do uh, with, with the Plan Vivo project and with the network we have. Next slide, please. And um, just thinking a little bit more about the future. So we have an ambitious vision to try and grow our impact by fivefold in the next five years. That would allow us to reach over 100,000 smallholders and um, scale up to reach half a million community members and put us set to deliver uh, over 20 million tons of CO2 reductions. And this would all be achieved through that model of equitable natural climate solutions. Now, to do that, that's, that's quite a big ask. And it means we would have to scale up our operations and what we do quite significantly. So we're in the process where at the moment we're growing our team. We've taken on some uh, new members of staff in the Plan Vivo Secretariat in the last couple of weeks. And they're on the, on the webinar today, so welcome to them. But we're looking to grow um, our projects, growing our existing projects. And, and to scale some of those up, that means developing some new service offerings and also trying to change or adapt the Plan Vivo standard itself to enable some of our projects to access new markets. And part of that, of course, that challenge of scaling up community level projects means it puts additional pressures onto some of the smallholders and communities who are involved in those projects. And a, a key enabler in that transition will be developing innovative technologies like farm trace uh, that can help these smallholders to continue to access the, the, the programs and to do monitoring at the scale and level that's required, but that's still affordable and accessible for them. And you'll hear a lot more from, from the Taking Root and Farm Trace team about how um, a tool like Farm Trace could enable that. Um, another area we're looking to grow in is branching out. So we're looking to develop new strategic partnerships with like minded organizations in the development and the conservation and in the private sector. And I know some of you guys will be on the webinar today. So we're, we're very keen to not just focus on what we do at the moment around the standard, but to look at other areas where there are mutually beneficial partnerships uh, and see where we can take the knowledge and experience from Plan Vivo and, and help and, and build some more impact in that space. And finally, we're looking to broaden our influence in the landscape. So not just looking at project level, but looking at the policy level, looking at what's happening in the carbon market and where Plan Vivo fits within that. And I think we feel a very strong obligation to speak for some of the projects we represent. Uh, as we said at the start, we believe in working with the people most affected by climate change, and we feel they have a lot of important things to say in some of the big debates uh, and in the agendas, post Paris agendas and SDGs. So we're really keen to engage in that space as well. But just to say all of this really is underpinned by having an inclusive, but also robust and rigorous process through Plan Vivo standard. And what you're gonna see today is really part of that process. So today you will be part of that process in terms of this community um, consultation about uh, how we would take a new approach into the standard. So I'll stop there and I'll hand back to Luke, who'll tell you more about that process, and then to Khalil and the team who'll tell you more about Farm Trace. But once again, very warm welcome and thank you so much for signing up today. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, for that introduction. Um, so moving back to the primary topic of the webinar today, um, 
farm trace has been submitted to Plan Vivo to become accepted as an approved approach. But what is an approved approach? An approved approach is a methodology or tool that is used in the quantification of climate benefits for Plan Vivo certified projects. Uh, the climate benefits being the CO2 that is uh, mitigated or removed from the atmosphere. Um, once approved, any project that uh, meets the requirements within the tool can use the tool to um, quantify its climate benefits when becoming certified under Plan Vivo. But as with any approved approach that is submitted to Plan Vivo, it must undergo a rigorous review process to ensure that, it re that the estimations represent robust and conservative estimates of uh, carbon emission reductions or removals. Now the Pharma Trace approved approach has already, is already going through this review process. Um, it has already passed the, the internal screening by the Technical Advisory Committee and is now onto the public consultation phase, where we hope to get the broader public to provide feedback and comments on the approved approach. Now, this, these, um, these comments and feedback can then be considered by the review team when deciding whether farm trace should be accepted as an approved approach. This webinar is just a part of the public consultation process giving you the opportunity to learn about the tool through a more engaging medium and also ask questions directly to the creators of the tool. However, if, if you want to see the full approved approach methodology and the documentation, please see the Farm Trace page on the Plan Vivo website. Um, and you can more formally submit feedback and comments to the email address shown on the screen, which is info at planvivofoundation.org. Now, I will hand you over to Khalil, the Executive Director at FarmTrace and longtime developer of the FarmTrace tool, who is going to tell you more about the tool. Over to you, Khalil. Thanks, Luke. Um, and hi, everyone. So today, I'm going to be presenting FarmTrace. It's a new software platform that we made to automate forest carbon quantification reporting using methods that are rigorous enough to be accepted by an international carbon standard yet easy and affordable so that it's accessible to everyone. Now, before going into all the details, I'd like to share a bit with you a bit of FarmTrace's origin story. So FarmTrace is a spin-off that was created by Taking Root, who's, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to improve farmer livelihoods by restoring global forest ecosystems. We've been, been developing smallholder forest carbon projects for over a decade, um, and we've faced in, in the scale up of the project, and as the project has grown and become more successful, um, we face some, some real challenges, which is what brought us to, to develop FarmTrace. So in particular, um, our project works with thousands and thousands of different farmers spread over really large distances. And part of our obligation as a carbon project is we need to quantify the carbon benefit that's being sequestered on all the, on all the millions of trees being sequestered on the thousands and thousands of farms spread over hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers. And so doing this um, rigorously and accurately enough, um, just became more and more expensive and complicated as the project scaled up. And so that's what led us to develop FarmTrace. So FarmTrace is now an independent company um, that hosts the technology component of FarmTrace. Um, and as Luke mentioned early on, is something that we've been working on for, for many, many, many years. And in particular, we formed a partnership with um, the University of British Columbia and a number of researchers to bring in some deep expertise in some areas that was really necessary to make a technology like this possible, notably, notably in remote sensing, machine learning, and forestry statistics. Um, so this really was a group collaboration, and I'm fortunate enough to have one of my co colleagues developing this methodology, Ignacio, on this call today, and who will be available for some questions if needed. Um, and also, I want to mention that FarmTrace, the technology as a whole, is hosted by a professional development team that's completely separate from Taking Root, which has a team of expert developers in geospatial analysis and software development based in both Nicaragua and Canada. So there's an international team working towards making FarmTrace um, the best that it can be. Um, so in this webinar, we're going to give a live demonstration of FarmTrace so you can see how easy and how neat it is to be able to use it. Um, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about why FarmTrace is so important and then give you a little of an explanation of how farm trace works. Now, as a pre-warning, some of this is gonna get quite <laughs> complicated and technical. 
And let's just remember that ultimately this is a methodology re review process. So we need to go into some of the details. Um, but what's really important, please remember all this complexity is happening in the background so that you don't actually have to deal with it. When you use FarmTrace, we built this to be as simple as possible so that you just use it as you go and all this complicated stuff happens in the background. And I really hope you'll see that when we give the, the live, present, live presentation. So let's get right into it. Most of us have probably already heard that natural climate solutions are absolutely essential if we're gonna meet our climate goals. Now, natural climate solutions are just nature's way of mediating climate change. And a lot, a lot of that has to do with growing and protecting trees. As you can see from the figure on my screen, natural climate solutions can take place in forest landscapes. And if you look at the areas that really have a lot of potential for mitigating climate change, by far we've got reforestation over here, which can be the really biggest driver of natural climate solutions. But right under that, we've got protecting existing forests um, or natural forest management. But it's not just what happens in forests that affects forests, but it's also what happens on farms. So in agricultural lands, some of the biggest areas of potential have to do with, again, growing trees within croplands. Or we've got this other big one over here, biochar. But biochar is really usually the conversion of biomass, usually forest biomass, once again, what locks in carbon into the soil. And then there's interventions we can do on wetlands, which again, have a lot to do with trees around restoring coastal areas um, and peatlands or protecting the existing forests on those, on those coastal areas. But what a lot of people don't necessarily realize is that smallholders are also indispensable in the fight against climate change if we are to leverage natural climate solutions. And this is because how we farm determines how we use the land, which is what either drives reforestation or deforestation. Just consider these really three important facts. First, deforestation is mostly driven by agricultural supply chains in the tropics. Two, most of the land that's available for reforestation actually takes place on land that's currently used for farming and in the tropics. And most of that land is managed by smallholder farmers. So the success of natural climate solutions ultimately depends on how we engage with farmers. But for farmers to become important allies in growing and protecting forests, we need to be able to measure forest carbon and prove that these outcomes are really taking place if we hope to make a difference. But to do that, we face some important challenges like we've learned in our experience developing a project um, and taking root. And that's just because measuring forest carbon is really complicated and it's expensive and it requires scarce expertise. And what's particularly challenging is that monitoring and evaluation of carbon, like many things, really benefits from economies of scale. But when we're working with all these really small farmers, we don't benefit from those economies of scale. And so the costs tend to be quite high. So if you think of the cost of monitoring as a function, monitoring carbon is a function of the amount of carbon you're actually sequestering. Um, for smallholder farmers that have these small farm sizes, these costs can be really, 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 really high. And as a result, a lot of projects that would really like to work about this, and we hear this all the time, people are like, oh, how do we get involved in this? And they wanna do it, but ultimately they can't do it because this part's too complicated. Um, or at the same time, the flip side of the whole thing, if you've got funders who really wanna allocate money towards a solution, but don't know where to best allocate that capital because we're not able to demonstrate outcomes in the areas that matter the most. So as a result, there's a lot of land around the world that really isn't being used to its full potential, either from a climate change perspective, but also in supporting farmers. So with that in mind, this is why we invented FarmTrace, to harness the potential of the world's smallholder farmers. Specifically, FarmTrace makes measuring forest carbon using rigorous scientific methods so easy that anyone can do it. And that's without the use of an expert or the need for an expert with as little to no effort as possible, without the need for complicated, expensive hardware and at really low marginal cost. Now we built FarmTrace for three types of organizations. The first, are those who directly work with smallholder farmers. Think farmer cooperatives, think project developers like Taking Root or outgrowers like integrated supply chains that source directly from smallholder farmers. And for them, we built FarmTrace as a management tool to help them manage their operations more effectively. And then also to facilitate market access by being able to demonstrate the sustainability um, impacts that these projects are creating. That in itself wasn't enough. So we also had to build FarmTrace 
um, for those who connect smallholders to markets. Now for this, think of like environmental NGOs, think of sustainability certifications or government institutions who are there working to support farmers to help access markets. And for them as well, farm trace is a management tool to be able to keep control of their operations and also to be able to report the impact to their funders and their donors to say, hey, look, we really had this impact and here's our proof. And finally, last but definitely not least, are those who are buying and financing smallholder farmers. Now think of food companies like coffee companies and cacao companies that buy lots of coffee and cacao from, from, that is primarily grown by smallholders. Or the traders who are involved into that intermediation between the actual farmers and the final buyers. Or even social lenders who are giving social finance. And for them, farm trace is about, well, sorry, well, farm trace is about um, measuring those impacts so that they can improve sustainability right within the heart of the supply chain. Now remember, the largest cause of deforestation is through supply chains. So if people want to make a difference, they really have to tackle those supply chains. Um, but then having this information and when you improve your supply chain, that becomes a powerful differenti differentiation technique in a competitive marketplace. Um, and it also, by knowing what's happening in your supply chain, it becomes a really great tool for reducing reputational risk so that you can make sure that bad things aren't happening at the origin of your supply chain. Um, so FarmTrace does this by creating two broad families of metrics. And now the first are sustainable impacts. Now in this presentation, we'll be focusing exclusively on forest carbon, but Farm Trace was built to report a number of other sustainable impacts like forest cover to demonstrate zero deforestation. And our team of developers are continuously developing new ones all the time, which we'll be releasing in the months, year, months and years to come. Now, the second family of metrics are those related to management, right? So that the people who are working with smallholder farmers directly can improve the supply or increase the supply of these sustainable impacts, notably sequestering carbon. And to do that, we had to create a bunch of tools to make it easier to know what you can do, when and where to improve those outcomes. So broadly speaking, this is how farm trace works. It starts off in the field through uh, the farm trace mobile app, where people who are working with farmers directly um, go out to the field and connect, collect, connect basic information. At the very minimum, they're just mapping the farm by walking the perimeter of the farm, but they could also be collecting some other simple information. Now, all of this is done offline. And so when they go back to the office, all they have to do is synchro synchronize their phone and the information goes from the phone to the web platform where it's combined with a whole bunch of other types of information that we collect globally, um, including uh, satellite imagery and process all that information using machine learning algorithms. And then that spits out the results onto a web platform, which means that anyone with the credentials can access this information when they need it, um, when they need it and where they need it. Now it's important to mention farm trace isn't to be used by smallholder farmers, rather it's used by the organizations that work with smallholder farmers. Now at this stage to properly understand farm trace, it's important to point out that satellite imagery is not, a, is not on its own is not enough. Um, people often think, oh no, this stuff already exists. Yeah, I've seen it. You can just get some satellite images and it's taken care of. But the thing is the relationship with how much carbon is in a, within a forest is really different in different forest types. And that's because forests look really different from above and different climates. Now to take an extreme example, imagine what a boreal forest in Northern Canada looks like in the winter time compared to a tropical rainforest, right? As you can see from the pictures in the bottom of my screen, they just look nothing alike. And so obviously the relationship with how much carbon is there is also completely different. And I know that's a pretty extreme example, but this phenomenon exists to a smaller extent, even within the same country, in the same climate, in the same season. Just by going up an elevation gradient to higher elevation, the structure of the forest changes enough that that carbon forest relationship is totally different. Now, to be able to get a relationship that works, you really have to collect information from the ground. You need to see the trees on the ground. But to do that, you need to collect robust data. And that's really challenging in this smallholder context because these farms are all over the place, really remote and really dispersed. So collecting that data becomes a major challenge. And lastly, and maybe this is really obvious, but it's worth pointing out, you actually have to know where you want to measure, right? It's not enough to say like, oh, this comes from Nicaragua. I'll just look at forest cover of the country as a whole. What matters is what's happening in forest cover in the areas you're actually sourcing from. Um, and so you need to, you actually have to know where your supply chain is and you need people to actually be out there mapping, um, mapping those individual parts of the land. 
And again, that sounds obvious, but in many cases, people don't actually know the exact origin of where things come from. And so without knowing that, how are you gonna even map it, even if you could do it with satellite imagery? So for these reasons, we developed FarbTrace to offer two different approaches to measuring forest carbon. Now these two approaches, I'm gonna present them separately, but they're very interrelated and they both sort of um, reinforce each other. Um, so the first one is based on field measurements. And so this is a, a method that we've made that's done manually by people using the mobile app and they go out as frequently as they need to or want to to go collect some information. Um, it's important to mention this stage, you do need a tiny bit of hardware, um, but it's very, very simple. Just any old mobile phone with an Android operating system where you can download the app from the, from the Play Store. Um, and a really simple tool to measure the tree. Um, there's different tools out there to do it, but basic most common one is just a diameter tape. And this is basically like a measuring tape, but it measures the diameter and you just measure the circumference of the tree and then you enter that information. Um, and by using this field measurement approach in the field, you can measure tiny little seedings that you just planted and you can measure really, really large trees um, to get these carbon estimates. And um, this step, while it works completely independently, the information you collect will actually serve for the second approach. And we'll get into that more later. So the information you collect on the field serves in the background to calibrate the second approach, which is based on satellite imagery. Now through satellite imagery, this is done completely automatically. Um, it's done by machine learning algorithms that are interpreting satellite imagery and producing the results. Um, and it's done every single month without you having to do anything. It just produces new results all the time. They just use it back and they come in. You don't need any hardware whatsoever. All you need is an internet connection to be able to get the information. Um, and this is gonna measure the carbon based on forest and vegetation cover. So it's also important to point out, we're not gonna observe seedlings that you just planted because they're just too tiny to be able to see from above. Um, and this approach is tailored to all the different eco regions of the world. Now I'm gonna go into each of these approaches in more detail. And this is where it's gonna get a bit more complicated, but remember this is the stuff that happens in the background. So I'm gonna explain how it works so that you don't have to actually do these things in reality. So starting with field measurements, it actually happens in three easy steps. The first one is you just go to the field with a phone and you map the parcel. After that, you measure a few trees and you get the results. In the background, these boxes in orange on my screen represent the various steps that FarmTrace is doing in the background. Um, and I'll get into these um, in, the, in the slides to come. So, to map the parcel, as I mentioned, you literally take your phone, you walk around the parcel, and when you're back in the office, you synchronize it and boom, you've mapped your parcel. Now, this sounds simple, but it's actually really valuable because normally the way people do this is first they need to buy a GPS, which themselves are a little bit expensive and not always sold in every little in every corner store. Um, and then once you've watched it, walk, walk the farm with the GPS, you have to plug in a cable and plug it into a, the computer and transfer the file onto a GIS, something like QGIS or more expensive softwares like ArcGIS. Or, um, and then it's, not, then it's not, still not over because then you have to link, okay, well that file belongs to this farmer and it represents this kind of farm and so you do a bunch of computer work. And it's already done by someone with some degree of expertise, um, which is sometimes quite rare to have in rural areas. And so not only is this a scarce resource, it's time consuming and ultimately it has a cost. Whereas in our system, we're doing this in, with like anyone can do it, right? It's just done instantly. Um, and then normally if you're gonna do a forest inventory, you would have to create these maps and going to tell which trees you're gonna measure where. And we've completely automated that process too. So after mapping the farm, as you can see on my screen, these monitoring points are just gonna appear on your phone and they're already geolocated and everything. And as you can see on my screen, it's kind of like a Google map. You see your location, you see the parcel that you mapped and you just have to walk over to the monitoring points, which are represented by these yellow circles, um, which tell you basically where to go measure trees. And their location is done randomly so that the trees that you measured will be representative of the parcel as a whole so you can get unbiased results so that it become um, defensible. Um, and again, the why this is valuable is that in, before we invented farm trace, we actually had to create these maps. So we had to use a GIS again. We had all these expertise and all these professionals doing this stuff. Um, it was time consuming, expensive, and now we've just completely eliminated that cost. Um, and then you measure the tree. And so we've got a little form and we've tried to make it as simple as possible. You've got a drop down menu where you, trick, you say the tree species that you're measuring. If you know it, if you don't know it, it doesn't matter. You just say, I don't know it. And then you measure whatever you can. 
Um, ideally, you just measure the, the diameter at breast height, the DBH, which is the easiest thing to measure on a tree. You just go wrap around it and put in that measurement into the phone. Um, and that in itself could be enough. But if you want to measure more information like the height, um, you can go and do that. Or if you just have the height because it's a small little tree, you can enter, you basically enter what you have. Um, and then we've also made it so that this drop down list is you personalize it so it only represents the tree species that exist in your area. You can change the Latin names to local names because we understand that even within the same language, different people, um, different countries or different cultures have many different names for even the same tree species. So you adapt it to make it as easy as possible, no spelling mistakes, et cetera. And when you're back in the internet or back with internet access, um, you just synchronize the phone and that information goes up into the cloud. And so what's happening in the background, and again, this is gonna get a bit technical, but this is the stuff that you don't actually have to know, especially when using the tool. But for the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna go into these details. Is those measurements you collected, like the diameter of the tree, they're gonna then get matched with um, what's called an above ground biomass equation. And that's something that's been done um, in, that we collected in, scientific, in the scientific literature that's gonna convert those simple measurements to estimate the, the biomass of the tree. So you say, for example, this tree was 30 centimeters. The equation tells you that was 800 kilos. Um, and it does this by going through this database that we've compiled, um, where we went through the literature and, we tried, and we've tried to find every single um, above ground biomass equation that's been published in the in scientific literature for all the tropical species that we could find in the world. And we actually think that through doing this process, we've built the largest database in the world on tropical above ground biomass models. Um, and so once we've done that, you then instantly, um, it connects you to another equation that's gonna estimate how much biomass is available in that tree below ground. So like in all the fine roots. And we'll sum that together to get the total biomass of the tree, both, both above ground and below ground. And then another series of equations is gonna convert that into carbon. So to just summarize here, you measure the tree, we tell you how much carbon is in there. Um, and by doing this, you no longer have to go search for these equations yourself. So when people are developing carbon projects and doing these things, this is actually one of the big components of their time is they got to find the best models and then they have to defend why they chose those models where we've completely removed that. Um, also, if you're doing a large project and you do things calculations on millions of trees, like your Excel sheet gets crazy, right? That is a lot of time, a whole bunch of expertise and chances are if you're doing it a million times, you're probably going to make some mistakes if you're doing it manually where us, this part is completely automated. This whole process that might've taken weeks or even months is done in like fractions of seconds. And what's really cool about it is that you've got a record. It's completely transparent and auditable. So if anyone's like, well, where does that number come from? You can completely go back and go line by line should you want to, most people don't, but if you want to, you can do that. And that's important for if you're having, being audited or there's some independent verifications that are happening. And so now that we know how much carbon is in each tree, we go to the next step and we extrapolate those results to the entire parcel level so that you're not measuring every single tree, you're just measuring a small sample and then we're getting the results at the parcel level. And again, this is where you do some extrapolation and some statistics, which normally these skills are rarely found in, in farming communities. And so this is completely removed and automated. Um, and so again, you're saving lots and lots of calculations and you just get your results. Um, so just to summarize all this complicated stuff, the fact is it remains quite simple. You go out there, you map the farm, you measure some trees, and you get some carbon, right? Um, and that's it. Now, that's the first approach. I'm going to talk about the second approach I mentioned earlier through the satellite imagery. And now this one is even easier. Um, this one essentially, provide you've done the first steps, you don't have to do anything. The satellite just is going to give you the result. Boom. It's not just going to give you the result one time. It's going to keep giving you the result month after month with you just sitting back and getting those answers. It's just like magic almost. But it's not magic. It's actually based on systematic scientific method. And I'm going to go through these steps um, in the slides to come where we're going to go through these different areas. Now, for each of these yellow boxes, it's a step that we've automated. And I've put this logo here to demonstrate that it's using input data that someone else collected, either you or someone else somewhere at another time um, to feed in the ground information so that you don't have to do this work. So I'm gonna go into this step by step. So the first, first, first step is that given that you've already mapped the parcel, we're gonna go fetch the satellite imagery. 
And we're getting that satellite imagery from the European Space Agency's Sentinel-2 mission. Um, and so these satellites or this constellation of satellites are collecting images over each farm at least every 10 days. Um, and we're automatically getting those images and automatically removing like obvious clouds and problems with the image. And so why, why does this matter? Is you no longer have to spend time trying to find which satellite images you should use with the most appropriate date. Where is it for that farm in particular? It's just completely automated. Um, now at this stage, I feel it important to mention, this satellite image isn't particularly meaningful. It's a multi-spectral image made of the whole bunch of bands of different elements of the light spectrum. It was never designed for the human eye to interpret it. So it's a bunch of mumbo jumbo that doesn't necessarily have that much meaning to it yet. And so in the next stage, we do is we composite these images. And what that means is we're creating these layers of, Im of various satellite images that are acquired around the same date. Because I said a new image comes in every 10 days. So we make like a stack of images. And each pixel of each place on the same parcel are lined up. And from that, we only choose the best pixel of that stack of pixels based on selecting the median value. And so we create this like hodgepodge mix to create a complete coverage of satellite imagery over that parcel. But each pixel and each band of each pixel is maybe made from a variety of different, um, different images to make one single one. And so by doing this, this completely auto removes things like clouds and other forms of atmospheric contamination. Um, and you got to the point where anyone just using the phone walking around their farm is getting these really great um, satellite composites of their farm just by doing nothing. And this is important because often in the areas that we work in, there's a lot of cloud cover and people say, oh yeah, we've tried to work with satellite imagery, but it didn't work because there's too much clouds. So how does your thing deal with it? And we're like, no, we completely have automated that process to remove all clouds and other things that might get in the way, in the way of the image. Now, at this point, we don't really know what we're looking at, right? It's just this complicated thing from space not made from the human eye. And so we have to interpret those images. And to interpret it, we match the information that people collected on the ground. So when you went out there or when someone went out there in the field to measure trees to get their carbon, they were actually, while they were doing it to find out how much carbon was in that tree, we're sort of reusing that data, repurposing it for a second, for a second purpose. And we're using that as the label. We're basically saying, okay, well, you just told me that there was a tree here and it had this much carbon in it, or and it was this kind of forest or whatever. Um, and that's what it looked like on the ground. And oh, look, here on the image, this is what it looks like. So now I have two different pieces of information of the exact same thing. One is measured on the ground and one is measured from space. And so that will help me build that relationship, right? Um, and then of course, I should mention that we've created a series of algorithms that go in and differentiate if if you collected bad data or good data. So of course, if there's a big, big tree in an area and you say, no, it's an open field, then you're basically lying to the system, but we've created a, a series of algorithms to detect those and remove them so that only the best data possible is being used for that training. Um, and this is really important because to get a proper assessment using satellite imagery, you really can't get better than ground measurements. So this is the highest way, highest quality way that you can properly do this. And then the next step, we use this machine learning algorithm that builds the relationship for us between what the pixel looked like from outer space um, and what it represented on the ground. Now, by complete coincidence, this machine learning algorithm actually happens to be called random forest <laughs> machine learning algorithm. And it was not developed by a forester, but I love the title. Um, and so as a result of this, we can now know just from the satellite imagery, what kind of vegetation cover exists on those pixels without even having to go there. And now um, the next step is we then take the parcel that we have within farm trace and look at every single pixel and using that, uh, that satellite, um, sorry, using that machine learning algorithm, we then determine the vegetation cover on each pixel within that entire parcel. So now we have a really good idea of what's going on, what the vegetation might look like throughout every farm, whether we've been there or not. And then we got to find the average carbon value for each one of those single vegetation cover classes. And so we, we have this information already because when you went to the ground, went to the field and measured those trees, you already told us how much carbon was there. Farm Trace calculated that in the first step. So by taking all the different measurements, we can find the average carbon value for each vegetation cover class. So you tell me, oh, this is an open field or Farm Trace will say, this is an open field. And then Farm Trace will say, well, open fields have this much carbon per hectare on average. 
And then as the very final phase of this step, knowing how much carbon is in each pixel type, we just have to sum those carbon values for each pixel that exists within that parcel. And we sum that all together to get the average carbon value per pixel. And so now you don't even have to visit a parcel. We can just know how much carbon is on that parcel by using this remote sensing. So as an end result is you're gonna get expert level estimations of how much carbon is on each parcel without having to do any extra work. Now, I should say that everything that I just explained to you so far was not built as a one size fits all approach, but rather it's tailored for every single eco region of the world. So if you're collecting data in one eco region, well, the data that you're collecting is being trained, used to train the machine learning algorithm, which will create a result that's unique to that eco region. As soon as you change ecoregions, it's going to be a new algorithm that's calibrated in a different way so that the results are always tailored to each ecoregion of the world. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so this way, we're, not, we're recognizing the diversity of the world's forests without um, saying it's a sort of one-size-fits-all approach. Now, this broad applicability of the tool is actually really important because if we want to reach the world's 500 million smallholder farmers, or at least as many of them as possible, we had to build FarmTrace to create value beyond just for traditional carbon project developers so that we could leverage the networks that already exist with all the different types of organizations that already exist now in the world that are working with smallholder farmers. Um, organizations like farmer cooperatives who are specializing in working with farmers, not doing carbon projects, right? Outgrowers, so these are companies that are sourcing from smallholder farmers directly. Commodity buyers, integrated food companies, local governments, NGOs, sustainability certification, social lenders, et cetera. This is this large network of organizations out there who are already working with smallholder farmers, are really interested in integrating a climate change component in their work, but are not professional carbon project developers. And in the experience that we've had so far, reaching out to organizations like this and working with them on farm trace, we learned a real important lesson. And that's that while everyone nowadays recognizes the importance of integrating a climate change component in their work, it's often seen as this extra burden, right? People have really complicated jobs and really busy lives. And to go say, hey, here's a whole bunch of extra work you need to do, that's just a major barrier to participating. Um, and so we built Farm Chase to create these management um, impacts that I mentioned earlier on. And so realizing that people already faced, had to go out and collect data and information in the field, and they faced all these challenges just in managing that data. And FarmTrace was actually built to manage data. And so by integrating these elements, we were able to build FarmTrace to actually reduce people's workload. So people already have to go collect information. Now we've just made it way, 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 way easier. Um, and by collecting that information, we can then give people like insights and say like, hey, if you want to do better, given that we know all this stuff, you might want to think about working over here or dealing with this. And oh, by the way, we're repurposing that data and giving you this carbon, this carbon insights. And so you're not having to work harder to get this new information. We made it so you have to work less hard and get more information. Um, so as a result of all this, we've found that FarmTrace does three broad things. First, we made it to minimize the effort and the cost of working with um, the farmers that you're already working with. Second, by having this information and processing it and creating these management insights, we actually found that you can drastically improve outcomes because all of a sudden things that used to be completely invisible to your organization are now completely visible. And now you know how to prioritize your resource use to get the most bang for your buck, so to speak. So you can actually get more impacts for less work. And while we ultimately built FarmTrace first and foremost as sort of like a, a measurement and evaluation tool around carbon. What we didn't expect, but what we found is that by creating this unparalleled transparency, it actually became a really great sales tool. Um, and this was never intended to be that way, but people, it just made the stories that we were telling so much more real because people could see firsthand, oh, I see what's going on. Oh no, now I really believe this. No, seeing this impact just changes everything. And so it was this really cool effect where this transparency and, uh, and this ability to audit and see exactly what's happening just really connected people more within their supply chains. Um, and so FarmTrace, although it's just starting out as being available to, to use by other organizations, we now have projects working in eight different countries on three in the three big tropical continents. So we've got 
projects going on in farm trace in Latin America and Africa and, and in Southeast Asia. So without further ado, to summarize all this, um, my colleague Will is going to give a presentation, a live demo, sorry, of how farm trace works. Um, and so you can move away from all this scientific complexity down to like the simplicity on the ground of how it works. So Will, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Khalil. Uh, and hi, everyone. Um, my name is Will Sheldon. I'm the commercial director at Taking Root and Farm Trace. Um, so I'm going to walk through kind of step by step everything that Khalil outlined, but just show you what it looks like on the platform. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is just show you how we input um, farmer data and how you map uh, a farm using the mobile app, and then how you conduct a field inventory through that mobile application. Uh, and then uh, we'll go into the web platform to show farm traces, forest uh, and carbon reporting and drill down into that information to show you how farm trace is fully auditable and you can kind of track every number uh, and see where it came from. And then we'll just give a kind of a bit of a quick overview over some of the um, management uh, for some of the management information. So um, how you track farmer visits and interventions, manage your staff activities and then also how you can create bespoke reporting, for example, to provide reporting for funders or to drill into specific areas of your projects that you want to look into. So I'm just going to bring up my screen um, and what you're seeing here is the farm trace, uh, the farm trace web platform. And it's worth saying that everything you're seeing on the screen today is live data from taking roots project in Nicaragua. And you'll see in this map view. Um, the first thing maybe to highlight is on the bottom left of the screen, just providing some high level um, indicators uh, and metrics. So you can see that we're working with um, uh, a little over 1,600 farmers um, across around 2,700 different parcels um, across over 6,000 hectares of land. And each one of those 2,700 parcels is represented by these polygons that you can see here. So each one of those is a parcel of land that we're working with, and those are connected to, uh, to a farmer, as you can see. And so here, if you click on any of these polygons, the map is fully dynamic. You can see who the farmer who's, who is managing the land and also start to see a little bit of basic information about that parcel. So how do we get that data into FarmTrace? Um, it's through the mobile app. Um, and it's worth saying if you have existing data, so for example, if you have existing farmer data or existing polygon data, you don't have to do this again. We just simply bulk import it into FarmTrace. But um, this is what you would do, for example, if you want to gather data that you don't already have. And so as a field technician, I would have FarmTrace on my mobile app. Uh, and I would just go into the app. And what you're seeing here is the different modules of FarmTrace. Now, because we're focusing, um, we're focusing on kind of the forest carbon elements, I'm not going to go over everything um, that FarmTrace does, but I'll just give a quick overview of the different modules. So the work log at the top is where technicians can track activities and visits to farmers. We then have our farmer module, which is where you can register farmers and add farmer information. We have our farm module, which is where you map farms and conduct field monitoring. We also have some um, payment modules uh, around distributing farmer payments. FarmTrace does not process payments itself, but it helps you track those payments. Um, for this webinar, we won't be going in, into this detail, but just to highlight it, um, as well as being able to track farmer harvests and purchases uh, from farmers for their commodities that they're, they're growing. Tracking um, workers, so ad hoc work when you're employing someone, uh, maybe to do some seasonal work or a day's work, you can track that in the platform as well as points of interest, which is just simply the ability to, to geotag um, certain instances or events. So for example, um, biodiversity sightings or um, maybe uh, tracking um, certain uh, activities or infractions when related to certification. So maybe a particular use of fertilizer, for example. But for the purposes of this demo, what we're really gonna focus here is on, um, is particularly on the farm module and conducting uh, forest carbon monitoring. So the first step as a field technician, if I go into the field, is going to be um, to register that farmer if they're not in the system. And we need to know the farmer because we want to connect the, their parcel of land to, to their profile. So I go into the farmer module and I created, um, uh, just for the sake of speeding things up a little, um, I created um, this profile already. And if I go into basic info, this is just the information I set up in advance. 
um, you can see that I've put in the program entry year of the farmer, um, I've provided their name, um, and I also set their region and community. Um, this is, these are fields that can be uh, customized um, for your different programs so you can reflect the regions and communities that you're working in. And for example, here, if I wanted, I could change these and select from the drop down that's all pre-configured for those regions and communities, as well as if needed, providing an ID uh, reference um, if required for the project. And it will also ask me uh, to take a photo uh, of the farmer and you can see I've already um, taken one there. And once I have that basic information, that's all you need. That's all Farm Trace asks, um, asks for, just because we need to know that basic information um, for who the farmer, farmer is. But if you want, you can also add additional information attached to that farmer. So for example, you can, um, you can add certain demographic information. So for example, uh, the date of birth, gender, uh, the number of people living in their house, uh, level of education, electricity or water. And so I could go in and add and track that demographic information if I so wish. Um, and the other thing just to highlight here is the ability to um, attach documents to farmers. So when working with farmers, often signing lots of, uh, like signing an agreement or signing a, a data sharing agreement. And so just made it really easy to be able to uh, track, that, track that document. Um, and I can, if I wanted, say it was a land title, I could attach it to a specific parcel, but in this case, I'm just gonna attach it to the farmer. And all you need to do as the technician is take a photo of the signed document and you can upload it so that you have that digital record and you have that audit trail of the paperwork that you have with farmers. So that was additional information that I provided. Um, and, but having entered that basic information about the farmer, the next step is then to map their farm uh, in the mobile app. Um, and it's worth just mentioning again, this is all done offline. Um, you do not need internet connectivity to be doing these activities. The data at this stage is just saved to your phone. So having added the farmer, I go into the farm module and I'm gonna create a new farm. So I'm gonna hit the plus button at the top. And again, the system is just gonna ask for a little bit of basic info. And so the first thing it's gonna ask is for the program entry year. Often farmers have multiple different parcels of land and you might be working with those different parcels at different times. And so it's really useful to differentiate between them. And I can say, for example, this parcel is entering this year in 2020. And then, I'm going to select the farmer uh, I want to work with in my mobile app here. I only have one farmer, but if I'm attached to multiple, they'll come up so I can select which farmer I want to attach the parcel to. And then I'll select the management unit. So for us, this means what type of forest are we working with? Are we working with a mixed species forest or a shade co coffee forest or is it a silver pastoral forest? And again, as a program, you can customize this list to be whatever makes sense for you in terms of how you want to break down um, your parcels and later on, essentially, how do you want to analyze them and report on them? So for this, I'm gonna say it's a mixed species forest and I'm gonna hit save. And once I've added that basic information, I simply need to hit the perimeter and farm traits using my GPS, uh, it doesn't need internet, but does just need GPS, will go to my location. So you can see here I am in, in Vancouver. Um, and to map the farm, I simply hit start at the bottom of my screen and I walk the perimeter of, of the parcel. Now, if this was live, you would see a red dot tracking, uh, tracking uh, my blue dot to show where I've walked. And once I've got to close to my start point, I hit stop and farm trace will automatically connect that start and end point to create the polygon. And as the technician, um, if I then get back within internet connectivity and I sync, that information is going to be uploaded to the platform. So um, uh, you're then going to be able to see that polygon appear in the map view. And having mapped that parcel, then the first step that Khalil talked about when it comes to gathering forest and carbon data was gathering uh, that field information. So. If I go back into my farm, oh, sorry, actually, if, I, if I'm the field technician and I'm visiting a farm, I'll just go into the map view. And again, it's gonna connect me to my location. And you can see that here's a farm that I mapped earlier, which is just a local park near, near, uh, near my house. 
And you can see that it's automatically generated these monitoring points. And so these are the monitoring points um, that Khalil mentioned. And if I click on one, um, you can see it says open. Now, if I was a technician, I would want to make sure that my blue dot was over this so that I'm gathering data from exactly the place that FarmTrace is asking me to gather data from. And I hit open for this monitoring point. And at this stage, all I need to do is count the number of trees uh, in the point. It's also worth stay, saying at this stage that as a program, you can customize um, how much coverage you want the monitoring points to have across the farm. So for example, you can say if um, what percentage of the farm you would like covered by the monitoring points and also what size uh, those monitoring points can be. And that can be everything from the whole parcel and counting every single tree to, for example, going down to, uh, for example, like 10% of the parcel. And so when I'm in that monitoring point, I'm going to count the number of trees in that point. I'm going to say there are trees and I'm going to add a tree. And here I get my drop down of tree species, which as Khalil mentioned, you configure to be the tree species that you're working with in your program. And so these are all of the tree species that, that we're working with in, in Nicaragua. I select the tree species. And if possible, um, using just a simple diameter tape, I'll, I'll gather diameter. And if, if I am able to also the height, I can enter any observation points. And so I add that tree and I can just keep adding trees until I've counted all the trees in that monitoring point. And having completed that point, I simply hit, I simply go to the next point and complete each point within the parcel. And so that's gathering that data to put into FarmTrace. And again, once I get back to internet connectivity, I sync and that data goes up into FarmTrace. And so where does, where does this data sit within FarmTrace? So I have, have my um, farm, farmer here and I can go to visit this parcel. And so if I go to visit this parcel, I can see here I've got information um, about the total number of, of trees as well as the carbon and some other indicators. I also have all that static information that we put in. So what type of parcel, what type of forest is being grown in this parcel or what type of agroforestry system, um, the total amount, uh, uh, total area, which is calculated once the farm uh, has been mapped. And also, for example, when did this parcel enter the program, um, the region and community uh, that it is as well. And so I see I have this total tree number. Um, and if I want, I can go to monitoring. And this is where that field data goes. So I gather that tree data from the monitoring points. And we can see here, that this is where all of the data gathered goes into FarmTrace. And so when that, when that data enters the FarmTrace web platform, it has a record of each tree. And um, we extrapolate the total number of trees across the parcel and also at the same time extrapolate the amount of carbon. And so I'm just gonna show you that journey of um, carbon extrapolation. So the first is that using the DBH and if possible height, we create a, a value for the above ground biomass. And we do that using an above ground biomass equation. And if I click on this number, um, FarmTrace will say what the calculation was and where exactly the source for that above ground biomass equation came from. When, when the tree species enters FarmTrace, we're trying to find the most relevant biomass equation for um, that tree species. So for example, in this situation, you can see it found exactly the same tree species as the one that was entered. If we don't have an exact match because there are some, um, some trees will not have a, a biomass equation, we then find the most relevant one. So for example, for the genus of, of that tree. And then we also, we, that gives us the above ground biomass and then we calculate the below ground biomass. And again, we give complete transparency as to how uh, that, uh, that number is calculated using a shoot to root ratio, and then also providing the source for how we generated that number. And then we add those two numbers together to get the total biomass for the tree, which um, is then converted into carbon. And again, giving full traceability of the calculation to get to the total carbon and expanding it to get the total number um, for the tree. And so line by line for every tree that was monitored, we then have um, the total carbon that is stored in that tree. And so this is really useful for auditable purposes, but realistically, you're not potentially going to go through line by line. 
And so what's potentially more interesting if we're, we're talking about trees is you can then go see a breakdown of the different tree species that are on the parcel. And so uh, here you can see um, on the top, these are the different monitoring points. And these are colored by tree density. So they're giving um, some information around where there's high tree density and where there's lower tree density. So again, kind of moving into more of that intervention space, as a technician, you might know that you want to go to this area of the parcel to see why tree density is lower um, or whether it might be higher and just understand if there's something that needs to be done. And here you can see um, all the different tree species summed to see the split of tree species across the parcel and also the total amount of CO2 that is being stored within those trees. And so that, as kind of Kilo mentioned, is how we get uh, use that field data to get the total number of trees and carbon for the parcel. Now, at the same time, when you map your parcel and connect it to FarmTrace, we automatically are gathering satellite imagery for it. And an example of this is NDVI. This is imagery that we are not processing, but it's just to demonstrate how we're bringing in that satellite imagery. Um, NDVI is simply a measure of green um, of the parcel. It's not necessarily saying whether there are trees or not. It's just saying where is there green vegetation and where is there not green vegetation. And so we're automatically bringing this information in the moment that the parcel is mapped. And then what we're doing is taking that field data and matching it with this satellite imagery to train the machine learning algorithm to automatically calculate and report on the carbon uh, that is being stored pixel by pixel on the parcel. And so if I go now to the carbon tab, I can see that the, that the parcel has to date, measured by the satellite imagery, um, is storing about 35 uh, tons of CO2. And I can go in and check, and this was, was actually field monitored. Um, and um, we can see that the, the two estimates are extremely close together. And it's also worth just mentioning here on the left, um, you can see um, the specific eco region for the farmer. So you know exactly which machine learning algorithm or which region is this data specific to, what data that satellite imagery is specific to. And so this is provided for every single parcel. So you can see um, where, which specific eco region is this part of for the results that I'm getting. And so, and, you know, Khalil went into lots of detail of what's happening in the background, um, but uh, you know that's how it's simple it is to come in and just see that tree and carbon data in, in FarmTrace. Um, and now I'm just going to touch on a few of the, the management pieces within FarmTrace. So for example, if I want to understand more about um, how I've been working with the farmer or interventions that have been taking place with the farmer, I'll go into the farmer tab. And this is going to give me a farmer profile. So it's going to, um, again, it's going to tell me region and community the farmer uh, is part of, as well as the technician who is assigned to them. And it's going to give me this high level information, for example, about the number of visits um, that the farmer has had and the different parcels they have in the program, as well as uh, their financial, uh, financial payments. Um, and so in this visits, I can see a breakdown not only of how often they've been visited, but when they were last visited, so I can see that this farmer was visited in the last month, which is extremely useful to know, as well as what different activities have been happening. So there were two monitoring visits, there was some parcel evaluation, as well as some distribution of materials. Um, and, you know, often just seeing, you know, numbers or satellite imagery is not enough, and you really want to know what's happening on the parcel itself. And so I can go and see more about these visits, and I can see um, a timeline of what's been happening on that parcel. And I'll very quickly just show you how this uh, information is put into the system, which is through the work log. And it's really simple. So I'll go into the work log as the technician. I will take a photo of the activity that I'm doing or the activity that the farmer is doing. Um, again, as the program, you customize the list of activities um, to select from. But for example, I could say I was doing monitoring. I then select the farmer or farmers I'm working with. So for example, if I'm giving a workshop, I'll be working with multiple farmers, but if it's just a one-on-one -on -one, uh, for monitoring, it's just gonna be with one farmer. And I hit save. And when I do that, this is the information that's being uploaded here. And you can see on a lot of these photos, you can see there is a little tick. And what this is showing is that we have GPS verified 
where that photo was taken. So again, through the mobile app and connecting it to the GPS of the phone and the GPS of the parcel location, all we're able to say is that, yes, this photo was taken on the parcel it said it was taken on. So again, just giving that further robust proof, um, not just from the sky and above, but actually on the parcel itself, that um, what trees are in the ground and how they're growing over time. Um, also, just very quickly, we'll touch on um, documentation. So for farmers, um, if you want, you can go in and um, make sure that documentation is in place. So making sure uh, A, that, that documentation is in place, but if you ever need it, for example, to go back to the original farm plan with the farmer, you can. So for example, I can go in and bring up the farm plan and I have that record of that original farm plan um, to either bring up with the farmer um, to go through or to assess afterwards, but also you know, have that auditability for um, any contracts that were signed and having the farmer data consent form. Um, and so that brings together a lot of this information that just makes it much easier to work with farmers um, in an effective way. And so um, for my farmer, the, the, the other thing that Farm Trace is bringing in is this um, staff data. So what's happening with my staff? And so, for example, if I was interested to know what um, Jose Norberto's uh, technician has been doing and see more about their work, I can click on them and it's going to take me to that technician. And I can see a breakdown of what activities Juan, one of our uh, team members in Nicaragua, um, has been doing. And I could select any one of the, our technicians to see uh, to go into them. And typically this is used by um, operations managers on the ground and the staff to go through and evaluate, okay, what work has been done? What work do we need to do? And is your focus the right focus? Are you seeing farmers as often as we would like? And use it to really improve operations. So for example, I can see um, what activities one has done. So there's been lots of parcel evaluations, um, some farmer meetings, weeding and recruitment. And I can see that over time, um, our project, like a lot, have very cyclical operations, so you can often plan um, ahead for what activities need to take place. And I can see Juan has been doing lots of parcel evaluations, but for example, I might say, uh, and there's been farmer meetings, but maybe we're about to go on a recruitment drive and I'd be able to have a conversation with Juan about how um, we would like to spend more time um, doing recruitment activities to bring farmers onto the program. And again, if I want to drill down into what activities Juan has been doing, I can go on to his activities and it's going to give me a, a breakdown of the, the different activities um, that he's been doing. So for example, I could select it for the last month. I'm going to see all the activities that he's recorded on his phone and the different parcel evaluations. And also, again, I'm going to get that geolocation verified that he is on the parcels that he said he was. And so again, just creating that storyline and proof of all the activity that's taking place in the project. And then just finally, um, just to, to wrap up the demo, um, we bring all this data into a program view. So um, you can see the total number of parcels you're working with, hectares, um, total number of trees, as well as um, the total CO2 that has been stored to date and tracked um, through FarmTrace. And um, if I want, I can drill into that data further. So for example, if I want to uh, find a specific subset of parcels to report against, I can do. So I go into the program parcels tab and here I have different variables I can check against. So for example, I only wanna find farmers that we've been working with in 2019. Um, I only wanna find management units of mixed species and uh, for example, one thing which I haven't shown in Farm Trace, but which um, you can do in the platform is link particular parcels to particular funders. So if, you, if I wanted, I could then filter down to a particular funder to find all, to find all the parcels that, that we are working with so I can communicate the impacts they're having directly to them. And so um, I just select uh, my variables and submit and Farm Trace is gonna retrieve all of that data and give me a breakdown. So for this funder, I have a report that I can just export out of FarmTrace to give complete transparency into um, who the farmers we're working with are, where their parcels are, how big they are, and what the impacts have been to date on those parcels. And that kind of links to how FarmTrace um, for us has actually become a really effective sales tool for communicating our impact um, to our clients and also um, the wider public. And so at this stage, I think I will, um, 
kind of wrap up the demo, um, having covered um, the main points um, of kind of getting data in, reporting on it, and then managing that data for impact. Um, it's worth saying the, the, the main purpose of this webinar, of course, is to review the farm trace methodology and get any feedback. Um, but we are actively looking to scale farm trace and scale farm traces impact. So um, if anyone is interested in using the platform or any projects and um, want to have a conversation about how they might use it, um, we would welcome anyone to get in touch with us after the webinar um, to have that discussion and to share more about the platform and learn more about your projects. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. And with that, I will pass back to Luke. Thank you, Will and Khalil, for your uh, explanation of farm trace and the demonstration of the tool. Now, okay, we're going to move into the Q&A section now, where I will pose some of your questions to farm trace or plan B vote, depending on which uh, team is most appropriate to answer it. Uh, to supporters in this section, um, we have Nick Berry join us, who's the um, head of our Plan Vivo's Technical Advisory Committee, um, and also the lead reviewer for the Farm Trace Approved Approach Review. And we have Ignacio, a remote sensing expert who has been helping Farm Trace develop the software over the past few years. So thank you very much both for joining us. And just to mention before we get stuck in that whilst we will do our best to answer the questions, we've had quite a lot to come through. Um, so I think we're going to prioritize them based on which ones have been voted the highest in the Q&A box. Um, if we don't answer your question, though, I do apologize, but you are more than welcome to contact either FarmTrace or Plan Vivo. Um, if your questions concern using the FarmTrace platform, you can contact FarmTrace at info at farmtrace.com. Or if it concerns feedback about the approved approach or how to use FarmTrace to generate Plan Vivo certificates, then you can contact uh, Plan Vivo at info at planvivofoundation.org. And a uh, final reminder that the full farm trace methodology documentation is on the Plan Vivo website and the public consultation closing date is the 28th of November. So we would ask um, people to get their comments and feedback in before then. So first question then, uh, I'll pose this to Khalil. It's how do you deal with a wide variety of species on a plot? Yeah. Um, so when someone goes out to the field and measures the tree species, it really doesn't matter, matter how many tree species are there, whether it's one tree species or 50 different tree species, provided the person collecting the information can identify those species. Um, and so we've got the, this drop down list of tree species that you can choose from, and you can configure it to depending on which region of the world, which tree species are within the drop down menu and you can select as many of them that you can identify. If you don't know the species, which happens a lot of the time, um, there's just put in the option unknown. And FarmTrace is always gonna use the best information, well, sorry, you'll use the best tools to process inf the information provided what's been, pro what's been collected. So if you know the tree species specific, you know, oh, this is this tree species, then we'll apply the formulas for that species if those formulas exist in the literature. If the model doesn't exist for that tree species in the literature, we'll use the second best model. So something from the same genus or the same climate or region. And in the same way, if you don't know the species, then we obviously can't do a species specific model, but we'll use a generalized model that's been built for that climate or that region of the world. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, another one for you, or maybe even for Will, uh, people asking about what the user costs are of this tool. So maybe you could talk a bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Luke. Um, so it's worth saying that Farm, farm Trace, it's um, being used and is in a number of, um, being used commercially by a number of different organizations. Um, and there's what the pricing is today and what our vision is as well. So I'll share what it is today, but I'd also like to share our vision for where we're going. Um, so the current license fee is based on an annual subscription um, and the, the minimum price, the pricing starts at $5,000 per year. And that's to report across 300 hectares of land with unlimited users. Um, as projects increase in size, there's a minimal fee per 100 hectares on top of that $5,000. 
But the bigger your project, the less that, that fee. And one of our intentions with FarmTrace is absolutely to make it as affordable as possible. Um, and at this stage, um, for everyone we're working with, the pricing is done on a case by case basis, depending on the particular needs and size of the project. Um, so with that kind of basic pricing in mind, um, if you are interested in learning more, we would welcome you to get in touch to, to, to learn more about your project and needs and then to um, apply pricing to that. And then in terms of the future, um, our vision is to create a model whereby anyone who is working directly with farmers, with smallholder farmers, um, so for example, farming cooperatives, that they can use farm trace for free. And one of the reasons for, for this vision is because we're trying to break down as many barriers as possible to smallholder farmers in the communities to access the benefits of implementing sustainable farming practices. And the way that farm trace and the business model would work is that buyers, um, so if you're a funder, or a buyer um, of carbon credits or, uh, or agricultural commodities, you would purchase um, the reporting from FarmTrace so that you have access to that reporting. And that would finance the groups on the ground to be able to use FarmTrace for free. Now, we're not at that stage yet and we need to develop the platform further and work with more projects um, to get to the scale where that model will work. Um, but that's our vision and that's, that's, what, we're working, uh, that's what we're working towards. Cheers, Will. Thank you for that. Super. Um, okay, next question. Appreciate just getting through these, but um, I think given the fact that we've only got around 13 minutes left, it'd be good to get through as many as possible. So um, another one for Farm Trace. Uh, how do you ensure the accuracy of the data provided by the smallholders and what is the margin of error? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, errors can come into the tool in, in a multiple number of ways, right? Um, you could measure information in the wrong place. You could falsify or accidentally add misinformation into the tool. Um, and then you could also have do all of that perfectly, but there'd just be a lot of variability in the data. Um, and so for each of these different ways, we have a different approach of dealing with it. Um, so I'll start by saying at the really big picture, we're automating accuracy assessments of, the, of the, the carbon estimates at the parcel level based on the variability in the existing data. Um, so if all the areas um, within a particular farm are very, very homogenous, then your overall accuracy is gonna be quite high. Where if they're super variable on your sample size, then it means that the variability as a whole is, might, is a lot higher. And we'll be reporting that within, um, within the tool. Um, there's also errors that can occur in terms of the classification using the side imagery. And we're also providing an overall accuracy, accuracy assessment for eco, each eco region of the world. Now, in terms of catching and detecting um, erroneous information, we have a series of algorithms um, that are used to detect that. And I'll share with you a little bit um, about the general principle that we use to detect it. Um, but in all, we don't necessarily disclose all of them because um, we're we want to make it as difficult as impossible to put bad information into the system. Um, but the general principle is based on statistics. So we have third party information around everywhere that's being collected. Um, and so we have a good idea of what is likely to be in that area. And so when information is reported, it's either close to expectations or kind of close to expectations or really far off. And so for extreme examples, we can triangulate and detect it um, and then not use it in the analysis. So for example, um, the simplest, simplest thing is if you're measuring a tree, but the GPS coordinate of the tree you measure doesn't correspond with the plot of where it should be, well, then that's not gonna work. Um, equally, if our satellite imagery says, oh, over here, we think we've got some dense forest and you're saying there's no trees, well then again, we've got some extreme values and so we'll detect things in that sort of way. Super, thank you very much. Um, okay, next one. Uh, what is the minimum number of trees per hectare that needs to be measured to ensure confidence of the calculated results? Yeah, um, the answer is zero. Um, we're looking at different vegetation types, right? And so one of the vegetation types you might find is a complete lack of forest, like an open field. And that's totally fine. 
So if you're out there and, and you say, if someone says, oh, there's no trees here, um, then that's what's being used to detect, oh, this is a, what the zero trees looks like from above. And so we're dividing the landscape into these different vegetation, these discrete different vegetation cover classes. And so for one vegetation cover class, it will be an open field and there can be no trees or a very low number of trees per hectare. Where at the other extreme, in a dense forest, we'd expect a lot, a lot of trees per hectare. And so it really accommodates, accommodates that complete diversity from like zero trees to some trees, to a lot of little trees, to big trees, to a sort of a big mature forest. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, the next one is, um, how can you ensure that measured trees aren't cut down at a later stage? I guess this is, is potentially more related to monitoring or maybe towards permanence. I'll let you have a think, um, but I'm happy to weigh in as well if you think it's more appropriate for us. Yeah, I, I sort of get the impression um, there's a, a plan vivo component to this and a farm trace component to it. Um, maybe I'll start with farm trace and let you talk about the plan vivo component of it. Um, from a farm trace perspective, um, farm trace is a tool for monitor is for reporting carbon, right? Um, it's not a program. It doesn't tell you how, it doesn't tell you how you should do things or not do things. It provides insights and transparency for other people for you to make those decisions. Um, so there's absolutely nothing in farm trace that is made to make it that you cannot cut down trees, but there's things made in farm trace to make it so that if trees are cut down, it will be reported. Okay, yeah, and um, I agree. I think there was a bit of, there was two parts in there because one was related to the monitoring side of things and the other one I think is related more to the carbon side of things. Um, I was wondering if I could pass that on to Nick Berry, if he's available. Um, Nick is the head of our technical advisory committee. So these, so this technical type of conversation is uh, best suited to him. So maybe he could explain a bit more about the permanent side of things for Plan Vivo. Sure. Um, so there's two, two parts to it. There's the monitoring that, happens during the project period. So then any increases in carbon stocks will be um, recorded through the project's monitoring. And then there's the period after the end of the, the project as well. So which would be where these issues of permanence come in. So what farm trace and tools like it have potential to do is to reduce those monitoring costs down to a very low level. So at the moment, uh, an issue faced by many Plan Vivo projects is the costs of monitoring over long periods of time needed to give assurances of over permanence. So I think this is one of the kind of opportunities that's there now with these new technologies is that we can kind of increase the length of time that monitoring can be cost effectively applied for within these kind of small scale areas so that um, we can provide greater assurances for the, the permanence of those benefits because the increases and the decreases in the carbon stocks in those areas will be both be detected. Okay, yeah, cheers. Thank you for that, Nick. Um, another question now, I think, again, more for farm trace. It's uh, on agricultural lands, how do you account for management such as pruning of tree crops? I guess this is more related to more um, small scale management practices. Can the, can the tool pick up those types of changes in carbon stock? Yeah, I guess uh, I can think of a few different ways of answering this. Um, the first is what can we detect from satellite imagery versus what can we not detect on satellite imagery and really fine level things like little seedlings or small changes to canopy cover um, might not be detected unless it's enough to transition something from one class to another. So dense forest to sparse forest. And so whether if, you're, if a pixel is considered a dense forest um, and there's a small change, it will still be a dense forest until there's enough of a small change that it goes over to the threshold to a non-dense forest. Um, so it really depends on the magnitude or how close you are to the threshold. Um, that's from a remote sensing um, perspective. From an on the ground perspective, we've got the, the part about the work logs that Will mentioned in the live demo, where you might go and do different activities and might make a statement right through a work log of, oh, we just literally did a pruning activity. And then you take on the ground photo evidence of it. And you'll use that as a management um, element because in many ways, pruning trees is often desirable, especially in agroforestry systems where you're trying to have some tree cover, but not too much shade because you also want the crops below to, to grow well. Um, 
And so you can, we've integrated the tool ways to integrate that information into your management so that you can use it um, as effectively as possible. Hey, amazing. Wow, we're flying through these. Um, <laughs> may be able to get through them all. No, no you still won't. But um, the next question was, we've had a couple um, at least around the idea of picking up trees below the canopy. Um, so I think one specific question was around uh, coffee uh, crops that have to be within shade and below the canopy. Can, can farm trees pick up those trees? And what if they are cut down as well? Uh, can farm trees pick that up also? Yeah, I feel like, again, this is like the two part, what can we do from outer space and what can we do on the ground? Um, and from outer space, we can really, um, you know, we see things from above. And so if you've got a dense canopy um, and there's some little coffee bushes underneath completely covered by that canopy, that will not be detected from outer space. Whereas if you have a fairly sparse forest and the trees are far apart, and then there's a clear line of sight from above to the coffee bushes or small trees, um, those will presumably be detected by the, by the imagery. Um, and then again, there's the ground information, right? So you can always look at, you can collect information from the ground and there, when you're measuring on the ground, you're gonna absolutely be able to detect it. Um, and in fact, in the, some of the projects we work with, like we work with a number of coffee projects, um, coffee plant density is an important variable that they'll take into account by using some ground data. Okay, hey, great. Um, one now, I guess, more around the security side of things, what security measures have you set up to ensure data collected is safe and secure? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a number of different security measures. I'm really not the best person to speak of it. I just know it at a high level, but maybe this is the place for high level answers. Um, the first is encryption and password protected. Um, so the, the database is um, on, a, on a highly secured um, database um, that is password protected and encrypted. If you don't set a good password, um, then someone can break can, if someone uses your password, then they can get in like any security measure. So you really have to use um, a good password if you're really worried about that data getting out there. Um, we also store all the data on a database in Canada um, and only in Canada for that reason. Um, some people are uncomfortable with having their data stored in other areas. Um, so I think that's a high level overview of data security. Yeah, great, thank you. Um... Okay, I think we've got time for two, maybe three more now, and then we'll have to uh, call it a day. So what criteria do you use to select the best available model? Uh, I think this is referring to uh, allometric models. Uh, yeah, why not use general uh, generic allometric equations like Chave et al? One of the things I like about best available models is its acronym is BAM. <laughs> um, <laughs> on, the publica on, on our publication um, of the methodology, which you can access on the website, we give a decision tree that we used in selecting the, the BAM, the best available model. Um, and so we always try and be as accurate as possible um, and as precise and specific as possible. But we always want to be able to give you an answer because um, there are a heck of a lot more tree species in the world than there are of above ground biomass equations or allometric equations in general. Um, and so these general models like uh, Chave and Al's papers that do these broad like region specific or climate specific is absolutely within um, farm trace. And in many, many cases, that is Chave and Al 2015 um, is, the, is the paper that's used. But if someone's done a species specific model, then we're gonna use a species specific model, not a really, really broad model like Chave and Al. Yeah, super. Um, okay, two more then. Um, how large is each monitoring point? Does each point need to be measured and staked for consistency? Mm. Um, okay, this gets technical. Um, first, when you do the monitoring as a program, as a farm trace user, you can set up the monitoring in different ways. You can use small monitoring plots or larger monitoring plots. Um, and you can set that up and there's some advantages and disadvantages to each, which I won't necessarily go into, but that's a variable that you get to get to decide. Um, and then given that monitoring point, um, we consider each monitoring point like a temporary sample plot. So as in, we're not necessarily tracking individual trees growth over time, but we're thinking it more at the parcel level. And so even though you might measure the same parcel and the, the same, sorry, monitoring, Point 
in the exact same location over time. Like if you put a metal stake in the ground and always made sure to go back to the exact same spot, you would do that, but we would still consider it like a temporary plot and we won't track the interconnectedness of different measures at different points of time. Um, and the reason that we do that is just that um, in many cases, the accuracy of people's GPSs aren't super, super, super precise. Um, and so we, it's more about the approximate location more than the exact location of those monitoring points. Um, and so that way, we'll, as long as we extrapolate upwards and we don't track the progression of individual trees over time, but the evolution of the parcel over time, that becomes um, statistically defensible. Okay, now onto the last question because we've hit uh, the hour. How do you handle regions where there were only a few, there was only a small amount of data available until now? Yeah, super cool question. Um, if FarmTrace, a program is set up using FarmTrace in a new region of the world where we have no field data, then FarmTrace is going to work perfectly in every way, except it won't give you carbon estimates using the satellite imagery. Um, it'll give you the satellite It'll give you the satellite imagery. It'll give you the NDVI and measures of green, but it won't tell you how much carbon's on that farm until there's enough data collected from that region. And so often when we work with projects, especially as we're starting out and projects are often the first project in their region working on it, we have to support them to collect a little bit of, uh, do a little bit of field monitoring themselves to set things up. Once things are set up, that field data doesn't, collection doesn't have to continue. Um, but of course, it's, if it does, then we get more and more information. Um, and I should also say that the data for the purposes of the forest calculations, the data is going to be aggregated across all projects within a different ecoregion. So you might be new to farm trace in an ecoregion, but provided that data has been collected in the past over there, you wouldn't have to do that. So it's only if you are in those cases where it's the first time that anyone's been there and we have no data. So we'll have to collect a bit before we can start interpreting carbon from the salad imagery. Okay, yes, yeah, that's super interesting. Thank you. Um, so I think that is us. We've hit the end of the webinar. Um, if you have any further questions, like I said earlier, please contact either Farm Trace or Plan Bevo. Otherwise, I'd like to say thank you for people who've been presenting today, Keith, uh, Will, and Khalil, and also Eva for helping organize this event and uh, completing all the background work. Uh, and I hope you all get in touch and have a wonderful day. Bye now.